Hello, my name is Anthony Mills. I'm the executive director of GINI, Global Innovation Institute. Recently, GINI published a new book called The Other Side of Growth, An Innovator's Responsibilities in an Emerging World. This book brought together nine diverse thought leaders from around the world to share their thoughts on the nature of, of innovation and the role it plays in growth and forces the readers to really think deeply about the implications of their new innovations, um, how those are driving growth and are, are being used to grow, drive growth, who they benefit, and how we can ensure that we're benefiting everyone for good. Today with me, I have one of the authors and contributors to this book, Teresa Spangler. Teresa is the founder and CEO of Plaza Bridge Group in Durham, North Carolina. Plaza Bridge is a consulting firm in innovation and technology development and product development. Teresa's chapter in this book is called Breaking the Paradoxes to Innovate for Good. So with that, I would like to say welcome, Teresa. Thank you, Anthony. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. So what I'd like to do today is to ask you some questions uh, about your chapter and your contribution, and really to try to pull out some of your thoughts to share with our audience uh, who wants to listen to this video about your chapter. Sure. So, excellent. So, so my first question is this. You refer to the paradoxes and talk about breaking the paradoxes. Speak to us briefly about what those paradoxes are and what it means to break them. So I, I think there's several, I'll talk uh, about one or two here, but I mean, the, the first one, which um, is probably the most evident one is that when we are developing technologies that we often are going towards speed and profitability, and we sometimes don't consider, and if you take deep fakes and facial recognition and biometrics and certain technologies, they can be really, really good, but they could have some real um, adverse effects if we're not careful if they're in the wrong hands. So I, you know, I think one of the paradoxes is how do, how do companies and the necessity for companies to take time, and not push so fast and hard, but to be considering the what if this had an, um, it got in the wrong hands. What if we had um, an integrity issue? What if data privacy, how do, we, how do we take concern of data privacy and put these in the forefront versus in you know, pushing through the technology and then coming back and thinking about it? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think it does. And, and so you know, the, the paradox there is uh, taking things that may have been an afterthought in the past and bringing them more to the forefront. Yes. Um, and, and, and in essence, thinking more holistically. Yes, Up absolutely. Up in the process about, you know, the implications of our innovation. Yeah, and, and I mean, the, the side of, you know, speed versus slowing things, speed and profitability versus we need to take time to be looking at these challenges that it may create when we're trying to be disruptive or be innovative um, in, in that regard. That makes sense. That lets us be more thoughtful mm -hmm. in the whole process about how our new innovations will impact uh, the greatest number of people, either positively or negatively. Right, right. Which would you say is something that organizations have not done as well as they could have in the past? I think, you know, I think we just didn't think about it. I mean, you, you, you take, um, I have to ask myself the question, why are we being hacked today? I mean, why are we in technology wars? could we have done a better job of having forethought into what happens if it gets into the wrong hands, what happens if it gets out of control and, had, and data privacy things. If we had put these in the forefront when we first developed these technologies, I believe we wouldn't be struggling as much as we are with some of the challenges that we face today. Very good, excellent point. Okay, so my next question is you use the term values-based purpose. Yes. Can you tell us in your own words what that means to you? Well, I think companies know today and individuals want purpose. I mean, we, we're all seeking to drive toward, are we, is our purpose to, you know, affect humanity or to affect the environment? Are we 
What is it that the good thing that we're doing? But values-based is what are the benefits that that individual or that customer or the segment of the market that you're going after and you're developing this thing for, what benefits will they derive from it? Because then you can measure purpose. If you have defined values very clearly and you've defined those benefits that they're gonna get in those value terms, you'll be successful in measuring, are you achieving that? I guess one example, not, not to mention any names, but some socially um, oriented commerce places, hot commerce sites, for example, had a purpose and had set some values, but they didn't meet them. For example, inclusiveness was a core component of their value statement to their customers and to their uh, internal staff, but the staff didn't see the transparency in delivering on that. So they did a good job of defining what those value, one of those value points might be, but they didn't deliver on it visually, commercially, that you couldn't see it in their marketing and, the, and their employees did not see transparency or um, action being taken on that value. So I, it, it's a double-edged sword. You have to deliver on it. You yeah. want to deliver on it, right? That's the way you engage your customers. So, so what I'm, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, defining those benefits clearly and making them measurable and then reporting on them, very important. That's exactly what I was going to ask you is, it sounds like we need to be very intentional and explicit about defining the values and making them measurable and actionable and be transparent about them. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Well, that's great. And, and I do believe that values-based purpose is really at the heart of a lot of what we're talking about in this book about the other side of growth. I do, I agree very much so. I also believe that, and you, you're gonna, I think maybe talk to this, but we're seeing that in um, some of the, um, the, the United Nations and ESG and sustainability um, initiatives that the, especially the millennial market, younger um, employees, younger investors, you know, not, you know, my generation is interested, but they're, they're making decisions on that. We are, we in our generation are learning, these are important factors and we're also making those decisions. But I think our, our young professionals are saying, this is critical. I don't want to work for a company that's not doing good. So that those are becoming central to, I think the effort of this book is to educate more on how and what you can do to engage that and to be a, a, a more thoughtful innovator. Absolutely, Teresa, you know, and I think you're right. And I think it began with the millennial generation and has continued on in the Gen Z generation yes. where, where people tend to be much more purpose focused and purpose is a larger element of, of what we're pursuing in a career and organization, not just, you know, a paycheck and, and delivering new products, but but going beyond that and really seeking out a purpose. Right. And, and you did mention the United Nations. So back in 2015, the UN developed what we now know as the current Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. Right. And, and you, in the book, you talk about how those are sort of a stepping stone toward breaking the so-called fast profit addiction. Mm -hmm. You want to elaborate that on that a little bit more? How, how do the SDGs really fit into this and prompt us to break that fast profit addiction? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One, if we just look at the UN's effort, and, and I'm not, you know, 100% versed in all that they did. What I do know is they built a cause that people could and companies could gravitate, leverage, and join in to contribute. So they raised the issue, and then they raised the um, vision of wanting to accomplish certain milestone goals by, I think it's the year um, 2050 or 2030, 2030, and they put the metrics together. And so in, in, in that case, organizations are able to leverage their research, leverage the metrics, leverage the different categories of where um, we're trying to conserve and, and to save the environment, um, that we're socially being responsible, that our governance is being transparent. They put these metrics in place and, and built a cohesive framework that anyone can gravitate. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying they put the framework in place so we have the components to go leverage. And, it's, and, it, and that is putting purpose 
with benefit, values-driven benefits, but making it such that we are doing good for our environment, we're doing good for humanity, and you will find how you measure your profits in that triple bottom line per se. So people profits and, and your measurements are all impacted on that. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I mean, I think you're 100% right. What the SDGs have done, they've given a very clear framework. And I think that framework has given voice to this, this passion for purpose yes. we now have. And, and, I, and I think it's raised the level of visibility uh, that industry has on pursuing a passion beyond just fast profit, but pursuing, uh, like you said, people, profit, and planet, and going for all three um, of those. And that is really bringing a lot of visibility into helping us think more holistically. Right. Uh, so I, so I, give, I give the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals a lot of credit for really bringing that. And I think that probably too was one of the big impetus. You can comment on this if you want, but in, in 2019, Business Roundtable came out and said that the purpose of a business isn't simply to make profit for shareholders, yeah. but it is to benefit all of the stakeholders, what we call yeah. stakeholder capitalism. Yes, yes. And and, it, and I think, you know, could, do I wish we had done this much many years sooner? <laughs> I do, but at least we are doing it. And I am seeing many companies start to really put um, you know, not just the, the Fortune 10, but major smaller companies, companies that just recently went um, public, they are putting ESG measures in place and starting to stick stakes in the ground and starting to share information with shareholders and being very data centric to measure where they are versus where they're going to be and how they get there. And so I think that's, um, you know, I think it's a really strong and evidence based way to say that profitability alone is not good for a company. It's not good for humanity necessarily if we aren't thinking about these things. You're right. And, and I believe you're a hundred percent right. And I believe that, um, you know, again, with younger workers in particular, they, they are not willing to work at organizations that are driven by purely profit. They, they want to work at organizations that have this more holistic view of purpose. Right. And um, I think, or uh, employers anymore have no choice uh, mm -hmm. if they want to have a world-class workforce yes. and engage, okay. you know, the most talented people, they have no choice but to embrace this. And I, and you alluded to some of the ESG programs in, in, in industry now. And I think, um, you know, ESG is a, a is a, a manifestation of that. Would, would you agree? I mean, what's your experience with the ESG programs? I, yes. I mean, I, I think it is. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, you know, the millennials and younger generations see what the planet, what's happening in our planet. It's also, you know, just what's happening with people and how, um, you know, we need to come together. We need to be more united. We need to be more open. We need to be more diverse. And they're raising the issues and they are, you know, the younger generation, my generation, I think we're all being much more aware of how important it is for that diversity of think and the and the and the diversity of what we're thinking about for the company company's actions and their purposes to be that it can't just be selling a product or a widget or shoes to you know whatever the whatever the items are technology or or consumer products that without some responsibility in developing those you you lose the majority of interest in the consumer base and the and that there this is going to be pushed through because i think there will be more um challenge if you're not doing that i don't i don't know that we'll have companies be successful if they're not doing that as you said the employees they're going to have a hard time attracting talent and when we go um help companies source talent sometimes if they're looking for real innovation uh teams and, and trying to fill out uh, gaps in the in the organization, one of the very first things that we get asked by candidates is, is what are they doing for good? What are, do they have an ESG strategy? What are they, what's their sustainability? You know, what's the inclusion? What's the diversity? Um, how are they dealing with these issues and things? Because I want to work for somebody that, that focuses on positive effects. It's an excellent point, you know, 
And I think the other point you made about consumers is equally valid. There is so much more transparency into organizations yeah. now with social media than there was 20 years ago. And organizations are being uh, really watched under a much closer microscope than they were and are being held accountable to a much higher standard. Absolutely. So, absolutely. And I think that's going to continue and there's going to be, I believe they'll, we'll see more technologies, more AI driven things that are going to help us net out those that are bad actors or not acting responsibly and, and those that are doing good. So right. I, I think, you know, technology may help us there. And I think, uh, you know, my sense is that pursuing good in business is an important ingredient for long-term resilience because I think 20 or 30 years from now, organizations that are focused purely on profit and that alone won't be around. I agree. I agree. And it, it feels a little sad that we even have to say that, it honestly. Does. Yes. But I think, you know, when you've got high growth, those, you, you, you know, I think there's a complacency to those things that become um, less profit driven, where you really have to focus and be intentional on doing good things. We get lost sometimes. And so hopefully in this case, we won't get lost because there's metrics and there's measures and there's responsibilities that are put in place and, and a, a um, responsibility to be transparent in the reporting of those things. So I, I think those are good actions that are gonna help us stay on that track. Very good, excellent. Well, those are excellent points. So I wanted to ask you one final question mm -hmm. um, before we end our time together. You talk about in your chapter, harvesting the human imagination. So talk to us more about harvesting the human imagination and the role that doing so really plays in, in what we're trying to achieve here. You know, I, um, I had an opportunity to talk to the um, writer and director of the documentary, Say It, Can, it Can't Be Done. And he, he brought this up to me. I mean, I think it's, um, he, he brought up the point that organizations today need more human imagination, more imagination teams. And, and I it really resonated with me. And, and in, in reality, we have a lot of things going on in innovation inside companies today. I mean, we are thinking about new products. The point is we're not thinking a lot of times big enough. You know, we can't all be Elon Musk, but certainly he is an Imagineer beyond, you know, and many in, the, in that quadrant are. But we can do that also in our smaller and, and large companies by setting up a few people that their role is just to imagine what's possible and take off the blinders and not look at what we currently do or what we have and, and don't think about the innovation and the stage gates and all of these process things that may hinder us from thinking beyond what we ever thought we could. And so that human, that harvesting the human imagination is developing the seeds for imagination with the people and the organization that you feel you could appoint to be that um, and bring them together and let them go play, let them go discover, let them go imagine what's possible beyond what their company originally or ever thought they could be, might find something completely different that would be incredibly good and profitable in the long run. I, but it does say you've got to have the long run glasses on. This isn't a short game. You're right. This is about the, the, long, the long play here. And, you know, I think having those visionaries in the organization that can truly look out at 5, 10, 15, 20, even maybe even 50 years and look at the trends that are happening and how those trends are going to impact our organization and one another right. and create new future scenarios. And then think about what the possible future scenarios are and how, uh, you know, there could be positive or negative scenarios, but how can we shape the future to be the positive scenario and, and make the future what we want it to be? We Absolutely. need those visionaries. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in the, in the challenge, you know, I, I do, did a, a number of invention projects where you're coming up with new, completely new ideas that don't exist. Um, and when you take the food issue that, you know, that we have to feed 9 billion people in the planet at, at some point in time, and we're way behind on how we're going to do that. Um, there, you think about, um, there's a project that put out in, a, in the most rural parts of the world which food is desperately needed. The, the 
request was to design a system that would dispense a healthy, nutritious food in three seconds at a kiosk mm -hmm. or some device, but you could get it anywhere, wherever you were in this rural region. And so it's kind of, if you develop challenges like that and you issue the challenge of where the most challenging uh, things in the company, in your company or in your customer base or in the world and just build relatable and, and again, take the blinders off, what could you create? And, you know, in three teams, we created some really pretty incredible ideas. Um, and when you stop to think, I don't know if it's going to work or not. And then you start to decide, oh, wow, wait a minute, this could work. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And, and you just turn off all the naysayers and this will never work kind of feedback that you get and you just go, you, you imagine. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for that very much. Um, in, in wrapping up, what, would, what is the call to action that you want people to take away from your, your chapter about breaking the, breaking the paradoxes? What do you want them to go do differently? You know, it, that's a great question. I, I, I think the, the first thing is to um, really instill in everyone in the company that yes, profitability is important, but not for the sacrifice of thinking through what this technology or this product might do if it was in the wrong hands or um, just not considering every safety consideration you possibly could. That really means you've got to break out scenarios and do thinking through the what ifs, the what ifs, the what ifs. Uh, so I think that's the first thing that, you know, and I don't believe profitability will suffer that much, but it may take a little more time. Uh, I think the second thing is to look at the frameworks. If you look at ESG and, and the, SDG, um, the SDG for framework and how they've created a vision, set the goals and the metrics, what could you do with a similar framework in your own organization, thinking bigger and having that visionary thing? What might that do to encourage new thinking inside the company? Um, and certainly, I think employing ESG in the company would be important in that regard as well. Um, but they're two different things in my mind. And then I think the third thing is get your one human imagineering individual um, or get a small two or three person team to imagine and just let them come to the table every now and then with ideas that were so far fetched, but don't give them negative feedback. Just go yes and not yes but but yes and and continue to challenge that thinking to bigger i think those were be, would be my three big things excellent so, thank yeah. you <laughs> thank you so much teresa that was You're welcome excellent excellent input and we very much appreciate your contribution to this book for our listeners i would encourage you to go find the book and purchase a copy for yourself you can find it on amazon or you can also find it on the GINI website uh, if you look under the Innovation Library. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.